I love things that fly. Um, powerless flight in particular. There's something about that. Hello there. Um, this is a um, this is a video about Horton the Horton Four flight, its efficiency, and the bell-shaped lift distribution. Um, I wanted to simulate the Horton Four flight in the book by Nicola and Wolfhart to discuss the claims made by um, by the book stating that the bell-shaped lift distribution is unsuitable for flying wing aircraft. Now we know that um, the NASA Prentel D aircraft um, stands in contrast with this claim. Um, and then I also just wanted to have a general discussion about what is needed from a tailless aircraft to be like uh, a world-class glider that can compete in the World Gliding Championship. Um, and this is obviously with respect to performance. Um, there's the question of handling quality as well, but let's leave that aside for now. So I decided just to um, simulate the flight in flight gear with the Horton HO229 because Horton 4 was not available um, readily. Maybe there is one somewhere, but I, I didn't have it in the default install. So, um, and to start the conversation, um, in page 443 to 444 from Nickel and Wolfhart, they state that the bell-shaped lift distribution is inappropriate for eliminating adverse yaw. And this is in direct contrast with um, the statements um, made in the NASA Prandtl D um, paper. Um, the bell-shaped list of lift distribution that the Hortons used were quite different from the one that was used on the Prandtl D. Um, the lift distribution on Prandtl D claimed uh, an 11% increase um, in efficiency but the Hortons actually just used the bell-shaped lift, lift distribution to to try and eliminate adverse yaw when um, the control surfaces were deflected so the the aims of the two distributions lift circulation distributions are quite quite different um, now the Prandtl, uh, Prandtl D type um, lift distribution has Prover's yaw as well. So even when when the aircraft is yawing in the, it it has the tendency to ride itself, which apparently the Horton Ford did not have. So it still had adverse yaw, and this is backed up by quite a number of people that flew the actual aircraft. So Nicola and Wolfhart makes the point that if it's still got this adverse yaw, then why use the bell-shaped lift, lift distribution? So now the question is, does the point in Nicola and Wolfhart have any stock or um, should we re-examine it now with the newest knowledge. So, the what inspired this video was the seeming contradiction between Nickel and Wolfhart and the NASA paper on the on the wings of minimum induced drag. So, uh, I set up a flight um, just to have as the background for this discussion. Um, that was discussed in in Nickel and Wolfhard. and it's it's a flight in Germany. It's close to Göttingen. It starts at the mountain called Hoher Hagen, or Hagen. Uh, I honestly don't know what the actual, the correct pronunciation is. Then it goes to a tower called Gaussturm. Um, Gaussturm, this tower. 
um, was actually um, completed, I think, in 19, what was it, 64 or something. So that was way after this flight actually occurred, because this flight actually occurred in the, in the 40s. And so um, the, the, the actual tower couldn't, uh, couldn't have existed at that stage. But there, there used to be a tower there that, that was at a more or less the same uh, location. But due to the expanse of a quarry, um, this, this tower collapsed and they had to build the, the new one. So that's, um, that's, that's what you see um, on the screen. So um, then the the flight goes on to a small town called uh, Kroos Ellerhausen. I'm not sure about the pronunciation once again. And then um, from there to a town called Hetchershausen. And there the aircraft flies over a church tower. And I think this um the the church tower that you see over here um saint marine kirche um this is probably the most likely um tower that that is referred to and then um the supposed landing zone was um just um following this town where um I'll be reading the the um, the pilot's account of, of of this flight, and then you get more or less a flight like like this, where the flight is in the order of ten eleven kilometers long. Now, um, according to Nicola and Wolfart, um, the 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 flight was eleven thousand seven hundred and sixty meters. Um, Wikipedia gives Gauss term uh, having a height of 51 meters. Um, but like I say, this is, this is the new tower, but no information was available on the old tower. So let's just use the new tower height. Um, and then let's use the flight distance of 11,760 meters. And uh, let us then take the aeronautical chart height of 1,575 feet. That's 480 meters. Then you add the 51 meters of the tower and you get four, 531 meters. The height of the landing point after that uh, church tower was 152 meters. So the height lost during the flight was 379 meters. And then that gives you a lift to drag ratio of 11,760 divided by 379, and that's roughly 31. So um, here's a simulation of the flight while I read the content of Nicola and Wolfart where the pilot describes his flight. Note that uh, the uh, Nicola and Wolfart book is sometimes has some anecdotal um, information and statements are sometimes sometimes ended with multiple exclamation points and that that I find to be a, a unique and strange choice for a for a factual document that's almost a textbook so I don't know if you want to take that into account but I certainly do so um, just take that into account so here from Nicola and Wolfart page 443 supposedly however there was one and only one flight with a Horton 4 which proved a gliding ratio of 36 or even 37 the analysis of this flight in the book of Horton Sellinger 1983 is founded however on incorrect data as their book went into print the correct values were not known to the authors R. Horton and P. F. Sellinger Furthermore, their description of that essential flight contains some inaccuracies. Therefore, the flight report on its evaluation by Heinz Schneidbauer 
is printed in what follows. On the 6th of May 1942, I made a calibration flight in the early morning for flying velocity steps. Takeoff 546, release 555 in 2000 meters, landing at 619. After the last flight, I step flew over the Gauss turn, a lookout tower near the city of Gottingen, with 100 meters to spare. I wanted to see if I could reach the airport from the height of the tower. Since I reached the airport with safety altitude, I arranged with Reimer Horton to make a test flight if the weather was suitable. The opportunity eventually came one month later. I had a large program to fly and therefore the flight preparations were already made in the dark. It was the 10th of June 1942 in the first flight of dawn when the aero tow took off at 4.49. Release time at five, uh, 10 past 5 and the altitude of 3,100 meters. After finishing the tests, I flew to Hoerhagen, the name of the mountain, and descended with the air brakes to the level exactly besides the tower. I was shocked to see that the forest moving closer, close, closely under me. Sometimes I even had to get out of the way of larger trees. In this way, I flew 10 uncomfortable minutes until the landing. When I flew between Hetchershausen and Gross Ellershausen, the two villages, the weathercock on the church of Hetchershausen already loomed somewhat over the horizon. I almost veered off before the power line because it was devilish short. I saw the high tension cables flit past under me like big hemp ropes. For the last 200 meters I had to go close to the ground so that by using the ground effect I could hop just over the hedge on the boundary of the airport. Then I was barely able to lower the skid and the machine touched the ground in the dew wet grass at 5.30. I did not even touch the lever of the air brakes because I had wanted to fly close to the hangars. Since nobody could have seen me I had first to walk to the hangars to get some help. Later, in full daylight, I went to the landing site with Mr. Reimer Horton to examine the glide angle. After publication of the book Nurflugel of Horton Sellinger in 1983, Heinz Schneidbauer got hold of the pre-war ordnance survey maps and also the new ones because the airport and the power line was not marked on the old ones. He continues, the land registry in Gottingen gives 538.67 meters as the height of Gaustern. The landing point is at a height of 152 meters, hence the height flown is 386.67 meters. The straight flight distance is 11,760 meters. This gives a gliding ratio of 30.4. If one adds 100 meters to the distance, which should approximately, approximately uh, uh, the real flight distance, allowing for slight deviations, then the gliding ratio is 30.7. By adding another 100 meters for losses due to the control movements for avoiding the trees as one gets, uh, 30.9. But only by adding very generously 300 meters, a gliding ratio of 31.2 is attained. Our wrong result at the time came obviously from the fact that the Hoge Hagen is marked with a height of 478.3 meters on the old aeronautical charts as well as on the old and new ordnance survey maps. The new aeronautical charts give 1,575 feet, which is approximately the same height, but these statements apply to the fork in the road and not the top of the tower. So let's discuss the consequences of this flight. Now, um, tests done by the Mississippi State University, I'll link the, the reference uh, below, um, shows that the statements in Nickel and Wolfhard are definitely true. 
the lift to drag um, ratio of the Horton 4 was definitely below 32. Um, and this um, is um, also uh, um, in agreement with, with data from the Deutsches Forschungsanstalt für Segelflug or the DFS and the Mississippi State tests and the DFS tests are are shown um, on the same graph um, in a sync polar plot. Um, so the flight as described there and the comments in Nickel and Wolfart are definitely um, verified against this source. Um, so what this tells us that uh, the bell-shaped lift distribution um, in this form as implemented by the Hortons did not prove to have extreme performance gains. Well, it wasn't designed for that in any case. Um, they only wanted to try and eliminate adverse yaw and supposedly the Horton 4 had the best um, elimination of this but still had the adverse yaw. Um, nor did the Taylor's design prove to have like extreme gains least compared to modern designs and there were even contemporary tail designs with similar lift to drag ratios um, of the Horton 4. Now extreme modern state-of-the-art um, examples of gliders are like the ETA which has a 75 to 1 lift to drag ratio. Then another extreme example is the Berlin um, glider that reached 76,000 feet and then um, when we go on to like world championship gliders um, the Junker cell plane JS3 has uh, a 56 to 1 um, or the flight manual actually says 55 to 1 uh, for the 18 meter um, version of the JS3 um, then looking at the Akaflieg SB13, which was a tailless design, a relatively modern tailless design with um, laminar flow profiles. Um, it has a lift to drag ratio, according to the Deutsches Museum, of 42 to 1 at 170, 107 kilometers per hour, and it had a 15 meter wingspan. Then another example is the a AKX, the Akaflieg Karlsruhe AKX. Uh, it doesn't have any um, published performance data yet, but it will also be a 15 meter um, span aircraft. So when the full version um, comes, gets built, it'll be interesting to see what what performance it has. Um, so a, a 37 lift to drag ratio in, in the context of these modern aircraft is, is not that extreme a claim. It can definitely be done. Um, in the time of the Horton 4, it was a high, it was a relatively high number. Um, but it has to be said that the modern aircraft do it with uh, the latest laminar fro flow profiles and very advanced aerodynamic designs. And um, a tailless aircraft would have to compete with this kind of performance. Um, of course, the Horton 4 didn't didn't even have laminar flow profiles. Um, so maybe a lift to drag ratio as calculated of 37 to 1 was probably quite uh, optimistic if, if you consider all, all these things. Um, but one has to now question or consider the fact that um, what what could be the lift to drag ratio if a Prandtl a proper Prandtl type um, bell lift distribution uh, with uh, eleven percent claimed uh, performance gain uh, was properly implemented? Would that be um, would that change this picture? And that's probably one of the questions that results from, from, from this video. So the conclusions, um, the Horton 4 
did not have a lift to drag ratio of higher than 31. Um, realistically, any glider that, that um, seeks to be competitive in the Glider World Championship needs a very high lift to drag ratio. Um, most likely better than 40, um, but probably in excess of 50. And it also needs excellent handling. And a tailless aircraft could potentially get there, um, but this would still entail a large amount of engineering work still to be done. Now, the the bell shaped lift distribution on the Horton Four is definitely was definitely different than a tip, than a Prandtl D type of bell um, lift distribution that could be implemented. Um, it's my conclusion that you definitely have to build a full-scale Prandtl type aircraft of at least 15 meters wingspan to verify the claim of 11% drag improvement. And you have to uh, verify that using flight tests because of the scale effect. Um, and, you know, any, any unforeseen things uh, that you can't simulate, like, for example, bugs or... Um, other type of fouling of of the aerodynamic surface that that gliders generally um, experience in in these kind of flights. Um, so this is clearly a challenge, as the Horton Four um, flight tests indi indicate. Um, the Mississippi State University um, does seem, in its recommendations and conclusions, it seems very optimistic that. Uh, up to a 50 lift to drag ratio could be achieved by cleaning up the Horton design and it even gives some suggestions as um, as to the the methodologies that could be followed to do this um, so, so it, 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 it shows a, a roadmap of drag improvement um, but probably you'd have to couple this with the Brandle type of bell lift distribution to achieve this, to unlock this performance gain. And um, let's see if 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 the future can can prove this to be to be accurate.